So how would you, how, um, how could we be more relationship based? How could we get to that place? What are some tips that you could give us? Well, actually spending time with people, which, which is becoming obviously more rare for public health reasons these days, but, um, uh, but with the pace of American life in general, uh, you would be amazed at the number of people that want to know more about our culture, but don't slow down enough to talk to an individual person who lives it every day. And so, we, uh, you know, it's actually about culture in general is about the shared actions of people. And and so go share in, in the actions of folks that you're interested in rather than a Google search or or, or whatever other um, approach you, you might take. Uh, because those direct relationships are what actually educate people. The absence of those direct relationships are what create things like the Boy Scouts of America, their bastardization of my spirituality, and they don't have a negative intention in their mind. To them, it's all positive and honoring, and they have a total misunderstanding of what cultural misappropriation is. They're doing my ceremonial stuff, and they're doing it wrong, and they're turning it into a club. I mean, that, I'm thinking of Dr. Joy right now. We gotta, we gotta talk about that soon. We gotta talk about that soon. I'm gonna add that to my list. I'm thinking about Dr. Joy. If you're, if you're, if you're adding to your list, write down Dr. Joy DeGry, D-E-G-R-U-Y. And, and, and listen to probably the most knowledgeable person I've ever heard speak about the impacts of, of slavery the real impacts and the real events of slavery. Uh, and and so, and she talks about a lot of things, but uh, uh, one of the things she describes is, is she calls cognitive dissonance and it's people's inability to really empathize with what our people have been through. And, and so, you know, uh, the youngest person executed in the history of our country was a little Pequot girl. Her name was Hannah Oquish, O-C-U-I-S-H, I-C-H-I-S-H. Hannah was hanged several weeks before her 13th birthday in a public execution here in New London, Connecticut. Hannah was said to have killed a six-year-old girl uh, from a wealthy family there in New London. And Hannah, as you look back at the records now, it's easy to see that Hannah was a, was afflicted with fetal alcohol syndrome, although they didn't know what that was in the day. Uh, and, and so a mentally challenged girl, short of her 13th birthday, was publicly hanged in New London, and people got their kids out of school early so they could watch. I mean, and and so one of the things Dr. Joy does is shows people the looks on on little white faces during lynchings. And she makes sure that folks understand what we have done to our children isn't just reflected on that little black child, it's reflected on the face of that other child in the photo too. Just an absolute disconnect with the humanity of our people. And uh, and so and so, it's it's distance and a lack of contact. You can't possibly have even one human relationship with a person of that culture, and and get to the point where you're getting a six-year-old out of school to go see some brown person get killed. Uh, you said um, Dr. Joy DeGray. Yeah. How did you spell DeGray again? D E G R U Y, I believe is the right spelling. Okay. I'm going to look that up because I think that that will be really impactful and I want to share that on um, our social media feed and on our website. Um, 
This conversation has been really great, by the way. Um, okay, okay. How long were uh, the British there before the war? Um, not very long. Uh, they they came in after our first con- our first conflict with the with the Dutch was in 1634, and it was shortly after that that the English um, took advantage of you know a break in the trade relationship, let's say, and they came uh, for themselves. They established a second. Uh, a uh, trading post uh, or fort on the Connecticut River. Uh, that was, oh gosh, there was that one. Hello, Middletown. Uh, Weathersfield. That one was in Weathersfield. And uh, and they immediately went to, went into trade-based conflict with both us and the Dutch. And so, it was about three years after that, uh, as a result of a man that we allegedly killed, a guy named John Stone, who was just not a good guy, to put it very, very mildly. And it wasn't even our tribe who killed him, although some tribal people did. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, they basically were using some of the minor conflict as a reason that they should just come in here and wipe us out. Um, our control of trade was a much bigger factor than our race at that point in time, I have no doubt. Um, can you tell us about the Pequot War? Well, uh, tribes have always had conflict with one another although our way of conflict is a bit different. We're more likely to steal corn and people to bring back to our tribal community uh, than to kill folks, although folks certainly died in conflicts between tribes, uh, never in mass, and just killing a whole bunch of people was never the point. Uh, and so, and so, uh, the, the, they went to tribes that we were in conflict with, um, the Mohegan and the Narragansett. Uh, now, mind you, that I am from Pequot and Narragansett ancestry, and so uh, and so both sets of my ancestors in that case were in conflict. The Mohegan and Narragansett actually showed the uh, British how to get to us in Mystic, where we were. We were on a hill that we still call Pequot Hill in Mystic, where now you see $2 million homes all over the place. Um, and, and almost all of it is developed, but that is the hill where our fort was. We still know the spot. We've actually been allowed by some of those um, really nice people, some of those folks up there and those million dollar homes are, uh, are folks who certainly feel empathy. They let us go in there and dig up their million dollar backyard so that we could find our uh, artifacts and prove where the fort was. So now we know where it is. And these kind of people allow us in two or three times a year so that we can do cultural ceremonies on the spot of the Mystic Fort, which is now in their backyard. So the tribes led them to us. Uh, the the way we would build forts, and it's a bit you'll see when you watch any of the TV shows, but we would build, we'd basically have logs right beside one another, making a big circle with an overlap at the end, so that in order to come inside of this palisade, you would have to come through that narrow area, and that was part of the way we defended it. Uh, and, and so things didn't go as well as they wanted, uh, despite their firearms early on. And at some point, uh, John Underhill and John Mason uh, decided to burn our people alive inside of these, uh, inside of our own wooden stockade. And so they got in, they lit all of the longhouses and witchers on fire and lit the, the, the logs that actually formed 
the stockade on fire and uh, and then they ran out. And so all of the people there were either burned to death inside or they came out uh, and were immediately killed with bayonets and rifles and whatever else um, the English had with them. Uh, this type of warfare was so strange to us that the Mohegan and Narragansett folks that led them there wouldn't participate when it got to this point. They were telling these folks, that's not how we do it and you shouldn't be, you know, uh, doing to people what you're doing. And they continued on. And so, and so hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, you'll see writing, if you go look at some of the uh, writings of John Mason or uh, any of the others, you'll hear them talk about how uh, all that came out, they entertained with the tip of a sword and basically telling us that uh, uh, sometimes God says that the kids should die with the parents. Wow. Yeah, so, uh, and, and, and my people were the savages, allegedly. Yeah, it's funny how that happens. <laughs> and so, in any event, uh, a lot of the history is quite ugly, and that's part of what um, that's part of what makes it easy to ignore because of how ugly it is. Uh, and so, and so after the war, uh, you know, is when they basically tried to complete the genocide and. And when you look at the number of laws that they passed against us, um, it's one of the few cases of, of state-sanctioned genocide that's documented that you can find. I mean, this is not something new that only happened to us, but very infrequently did folks um, actually write down all of it. and. Uh, and so anyway, all of that ended in uh, the Treaty of Hartford, which uh, is another thing that you might want to look into a little bit. Um, but but uh, that's where they divided us up among the Mohegan and Narragansetts. Um, I don't think they actually mention in the treaty those that they sold into slavery in the Bermuda and in the Bahamas. But... Uh, but Yeah, I'll check that out. Um, how did you reclaim the land? Well, they stuck us on the reservation, uh, you know, in 1666. Uh, although, ironically enough, because of their spiritual beliefs, um, they put 1667 on the sign out front. Uh, <laughs> it still has the wrong date on it to this day. Uh, and so we have been here, although for periods of time, folks have had to leave just to survive because they naturally put us on, on ledge and swamp. Uh, land in those days that was considered worthless, and that's what made this an Indian reservation to begin with. We were the Indians of North Groton before Ledger existed. Uh, yet, uh, the elected leader of Ledyard today wants to call himself the host community of my tribal community. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how you can possibly host somebody that got there before you did. But um, again, folks uh, take the history they want to, and they discard the history that either offends them or makes them uncomfortable in some other way. And so. And so, uh, you know, Underhill uh, was was a, a, just a really violent man, um, and, and I mean, he he actually went around. John Mason, on the one hand, uh, this was kind of the major the major conflict 
uh, military-wise for John Mason, and you won't see his name uh, much associated with with anything else. But Underhill used Mystic as a training ground of, of sorts for himself. He went on to offer himself to the British and to the Dutch uh, as a bit of an Indian exterminator after that. And he did the very same thing throughout Connecticut, New York, and other places where he would take whatever men they would give him and just go massacre folks. Um, I mean, uh, there's a place right there. Well, Manhattan is on top of it today, but a place called Pound Ridge in uh, what is now Manhattan, where well, this was seven years after what happened at Mystic, so it would have been 1644. Uh, he had worked his way to what is now New York, attacked a tribe in the middle of a cultural celebration where other tribes had joined um, for song and dance and, and food and all of the things that we still do today at what folks call a powwow. Um, waited for them to be in the midst of their cultural celebration and then attacked and attempted to wipe them out mystic style. Um, and that was seven years later. He had already done it three times after mystic before he made it to Pound Ridge. That's just horrible. It's just horrible. History, man. The more you, the more you look, like, the more you look, um, that's, that's really tough. Um, how do, how do the people, sorry, you were saying something? I, I was only going to say, when you talk about, uh, you know, the relationship base, and, and I talk about the folks, obviously, that we never had a relationship with in these conflicts. That doesn't mean that we can't get to truth and reconciliation today. Just a year ago, um, our tribe was sent the most wonderful letter by one of the descendants of John Mason, uh, who apologized for her grandfather and what he did. And uh, the most sincere letter, and we passed it around to people in the tribal family. And at some point, we'll probably bring that lady up here and honor her in some way. Um, and so even those old things uh, can be healed if folks go through truth. Because certainly the John Mason descendants are still around. I mean, Underhill descendants are still around. Connecticut is Connecticut. There's a lot of old blue blood here. That is so amazing. I'm, I'm so glad that she did that. I think that's so cool because I think a lot of people who are like part of their problem with diving into history is they don't know how they can make it right. But sometimes saying you're sorry is part of it, but it's, it doesn't heal all of it, but. No, but when, but, but literally at that point, you've done everything that you can do. You acknowledge the truth and you showed a little bit of human empathy. And from that, and from that, a relationship can begin. When you share that, we would like, we would love to share that with, with, um, with our following. So, please keep us posted on, on that story. Um, how do uh, the Pequot, Pequots honor the practices they had before uh, gentrification and the banning of the way of living? How did we, I'm sorry. How did you, how did the Pequots honor the practices that you had before gentrification and the banning of your way of living? We honor, honor them by continuing to do them. And so, uh, you know, we build traditional longhouses in this community. Uh, we, we still pray the way that we prayed. I mean, uh, my son turned 13 this summer and so he started sweat lodge ceremonies. Um, same guy that made that little piece of wampum I showed you earlier. And so we still do what we did while we also do the things that normal Americans do, you know, uh, order things from Amazon and way too much takeout food. Very nice. Who are some key people that are responsible for the tribe's ability to beat the odds? Wow, there are a lot of people in that category. My grandmother is certainly one of them. Uh, my grandmother was Dr. Phyllis Monroe Waite, uh, not only a matriarch for the tribe, but 
a community activist um, before and after she returned to her reservation here in Connecticut. And so, um, you know, my grandmother's, my grandmother created her first community-based organization. And I shouldn't say she did it alone because there are a half dozen people, uh, but she was the leader of the group in 1966, two years before I was born. Now for a woman of color to create any community-based organization in 1966 was remarkable. But my grandmother went to the powers uh, that were in that part of Rhode Island and she showed them a plan for daycare uh, and preschool for minority kids that were not being allowed into uh, the, the daycares in that part of Rhode Island in the 1960s. And she showed them a plan. She showed them some financial backers on paper and told them that she was going to create a daycare center. And all she wanted to know was would they help or would she have to do it herself? If she had to do it herself, she told them it would be named McCain Daycare Center, Citizens for the Advancement of Negro Education. So it was Cain with a dot after all of the letters. And she said to those town fathers, if you contribute annually to this daycare as much as you do to the others, um, then we'll remove the dots and this could be a Cain Daycare Center for everybody. Uh, if you don't, we're gonna service our kids and you'll see Cain the way we made Cain. Uh, the town fathers, gave her funding for that daycare center. Um, 10 years later, or eight years later, however long it was, I, her grandson, attended that daycare center. That daycare center still exists today, serving minority kids. And the only difference was the dot came out after those four letters. And so you can look in Wakefield, Rhode Island today and see the Kane Daycare Center flourishing. Um, my grandmother created another community-based organization there in Rhode Island. This is while she's in the land of our Narragansett ancestors before we came back to Connecticut to the land of our Pequot ancestors. So there's an organization called South County Community Action, still uh, alive today. That is the one she started in 1966. Unfortunately, it's been completely co-opted, I would say, um, by folks who don't allow it to predominantly serve minority communities anymore. As a matter of fact, the last time I went on the website for my grandmother's organization, I could not find a brown face on the board or the staff or not many even in the promotional material for the families they serve. But the organization still exists. And, uh, and so those were the things she did before she came to Mashantucket where she created the healthcare system that still serves uh, all tribal people and employees today. Uh, the tribe's remote pharmaceutical distribution business she created and was the first board of directors, uh, the first health clinic in the, in the tribal community. Anyway, my grandmother uh, did things that- Your grandmother is amazing things that none of us could match. I mean, just, it, she was, she was a ball of fire. That's amazing. Um, do you have any, like, written pieces on her? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, in the community center, unfortunately not here. I'm doing this from home today. Uh, I was in the office this morning, but I can send you something for sure. Yes, please, because I would love to read more about her. And then this is my last question. I've kept you here for so long, but who are uh, some of the faces of the Peacock tribe today who are doing amazing things? Oh my goodness, there are so many. Um, I mean, uh, Jason Guyot is uh, a cousin and is the first Pequot to become the chief executive officer at Foxwoods. Okay. For 30 years, we've been hiring outsiders to be the top uh, leader at our own casino, while some of our own people tried to get ready and didn't. Um, and 
There were even a few people I thought were ready that just couldn't generate the support. But, um, and so to have one of our own folks who grew up in this tribal community uh, leading that resort is a big deal. But there are many success stories. I mean, another one uh, that jumps to mind is we have a Pequot attorney in our Office of Legal Counsel who literally went to lunch with me one day and put a plan for herself on the back of a napkin how she was going to go to law school and she was going to come back to her tribal community and frankly has done everything on the napkin in the last 15 years uh, and is now one of the senior attorneys for her tribe. Um, must have been a hell of a good uh, plate of buffalo wings is my assumption that day. Uh, <laughs> or maybe just really good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so anyway, there are just, there are lots and lots of them. I mean, uh, there is a young Pequot relative right now leading the museum itself, uh, Joshua Carter, um, who, who uh, again, is another of my grandmother's grandchildren. And so um, aside from making lots of community progress, she made lots of grandkids. And so uh, there, are, there are many, many of them. I mean, uh, there is a, there is a Pequot. We'll talk about another one doing a great job. We have a Pequot relative running our National Governmental Affairs Office in Washington, D.C. And, you know, perhaps one day I'll get a chance to connect you to her. Uh, she certainly could tell you all about what we do to try to defend ourselves uh, and advance our people down there in Washington. But the point for your uh, audience especially to know is that we don't succeed in any of those places without African-American relationships that support us. Uh, and so, you know, without John Lewis or Jim Clyburn or any number of people in Washington, D.C., um, and even a, a lot of non-minority folks uh, but, but who are folks that would join the Native American or the African American caucus. Um, and so the first place we go for legislative support, and it has always been this way, is to those minority caucuses. Our relationship with the Black and Puerto Rican caucus in Hartford is older than I am. Uh, you know, my grandmother and my mother were working with people from, from you know, minority leaderships uh, uh, positions in those days. And so, you know, the legacy of Annette Carter uh, means as much to people in Mashantucket as it does to people in Hartford. Uh, probably one of the Black and Puerto Rican caucus leaders that embraced us the most. I mean... And the Carter family, aside from having the same ancestral name as my African-American grandfather, those folks are family today to everybody in Washington. Uh, and so, and so anyway, um, Thurman Milner, I mean, anyway, the connections to, to uh, Hartford are really deep and really long for us, and they're still there today, which is why I want to mention, you know, the modern things. Uh, Mr. Milner, Mr. Milner was a huge supporter, and uh, and again, you you, I talk about the hidden history. It's not just old slavery type stuff or the barbarian in Central Park. If you ask most kids in most schools in New England today, who was the first African American elected mayor in the history of New England? Most of them wouldn't be able to tell you Thurman Milner. And that's a shame. It is. But thank you for sharing that. Um, it, makes, it makes me feel good to know what like, you know, we're doing. We're killing it out here. Um, but if if we can do anything over here at North Nations, please let us know. Um, thank you, thank you so much for this awesome interview. Um, thank you all for staying tuned. There were just so uh, many questions that we got through, but we hope that this was really helpful to you. And we hope to have Michael Thomas back here again. Do you have something to say? Oh, no, I was just telling my son to open the door because he's knocking while I'm in the middle of the Zoom meeting. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in and have a wonderful day.